Welcome to an all-new episode of Get Lit with Leanna, the podcast. Join me as I sit down with a new guest author in each episode to discuss their books, careers, and everything in between. Today I'm joined by romance author Jean Meltzer to chat about her new book, Kissing Kosher. I've been such a fan of Jean's books for so long, so I was very excited to have this conversation with her, and I went into it thinking that I knew a lot about her. I was in for the shock of my life. There is so much about her story I had no idea about, and I absolutely loved this conversation. We talked about her first book, The Matzo Ball, and how it's being made into a movie produced by Lance Bass of InSync and Ben Savage, aka Corey from Boy Meets World. And then we talked about this story, the genesis of it, the meaning behind it, and then so many important values that she incorporated through the story. This was such a beautiful conversation. I loved it so much. I was grinning from ear to ear the entire time, and I know you'll love it too. So without further ado, my conversation with Jean Meltzer starts right now. Welcome, Jean, to the podcast. I'm Mm -hmm. so excited to have you here. Obviously, I've been a very big fan of your books for like two years now since obviously the Matzo Ball came out, and I'm just so thrilled to have you here to talk about your latest book. And dare I say, it is my favorite that you've written yet. And I feel like that's consensus across the board. Like everything I've seen from ARC readers and people who are excited and privileged like me to get to read the book a little bit early. Everyone's just been saying that like, this is your best book yet. So first of all, Muzzle Swift to you. Congratulations. I'm so excited. You have so many exciting things though happening right now beyond obviously this new release. So there's just so much to talk to you about. But before we get into Kissing Kosher, I would love to chat a little bit about your background. I normally go into these episodes like relatively blind, um, Mm -hmm. but I am a fan of yours and your book. So there are some things I am privy to that maybe some people who aren't so familiar with your work don't know. But firstly, I would love to know a little bit about like how you started writing. And I know your writing background is super interesting because of your TV background. So just like take me back to how all of this kind of started. So I think for me, I was absolutely always uh, sort of interested in the written word. I was sort of called to the written word. word. I still remember uh, learning my ABCs in preschool. I can actually remember my teacher writing A, B, C on the bulletin board, and it is like steered in my brain. Wow. Um, I remember writing sort of my first short story around kindergarten. Um, and But for me, my really big sort of like aha moment was in sixth grade. Uh, My teacher, Mrs. Lakuta, uh, she saw something. We had been sent home to write a story, a short story. And I wrote this story about a princess named Carolot, uh, Princess Carolot, which which shows we don't really change all that much from our childhood. I would say (laughs) that I I still consider myself a Princess Carolot. I'm still writing my (laughs) Princess Carolot into all my stories. I love that. Um, But uh, the next day, she had sort of read my story, and she said, Jean, this is really good. Do you want to read this to the class? And of course, you know, middle child, I was like, yes, (laughs) attention and whatever. And I remember all my classmates started laughing. They they loved my story, and it became this thing. Jean Meltzer would come in with stories, and all throughout sixth grade, I would read to my class. And I was sort of known as the writer and it sort of set my trajectory going forward that I was always that I wanted to be a writer, that this was what I was good at. This is what I had some calling to do. And truthfully, I was really terrible at everything else. Despite being the daughter of like two doctors, I got a C in math, a D (laughs) in science. I am incapable of basically doing anything but writing. So it sort of set my path. Yeah. And I wound up going to college for it. Okay. Crazy. So how did you kind of like make a career out of this? Like, tell me about TV writing. Was that something you wanted to do more than novel writing? Like, tell me about that whole experience before your first published book. (laughs) So interestingly enough, um, so I went to NYU Tisch to study dramatic writing. I really did love film. I still love film. I love uh, the medium, especially of like independent storytelling. Uh, and so um, I went into school and through through my years there, I specifically studied screenwriting. Um, I, I also really liked reality television. So one day, yes, 
call me, talk to me if you want to talk about 90 Day Fiance, Sister oh. Wives, all, <laughs> if you're Real Housewives. I am your person. I am your girl. I follow it. I, I go on the forums. I see what people are saying. I love that. I, Yes, you would never know it, uh, but it's true. <laughs> um, and so I saw this like ad for an internship. Uh, I was graduating college. I needed a job. And it was an internship for developing reality television. And I was like, this is my jam. <laughs> and so I wound up uh, taking the internship. I then from there got hired to be a development executive. And from there, I served, sold my first format to the Discovery Channel. And um, within the, a year... I was uh, producing a daily show for Discovery and shortly after nominated for an Emmy. So uh, that's sort of, but here's the here's the interesting thing about that, that journey. So I sort of knew I always wanted to go into TV, into film. Um, I got that dream. I was very successful, very young. And then dun, 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 jokes on me. The problem was I wasn't very happy. I wasn't happy at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I started to do some soul searching. And I realized I was kind of living for my goals and not my values, at which point I I uh, decided to live for my values. And I wound up actually leaving my career in uh, entertainment to move to Israel to become a rabbi. Wait, what? You didn't know that? <laughs> Quit no. my job, boarded a plane, moved to Israel, made my mother cry. You didn't Stop. know that? No. Stop How? For real. Hey, how old were you? I was 26. Wow. And you were living <laughs> in New York, working in TV, and you were like, I'm making all yeah, I'm going, I'm going to be a rabbi. Yeah, basically. I mean, I, when I say <laughs> I really, I, I, I had a moment, I came yeah. to a process, I returned a true Baal Shuva in a way. Um, if you know what that means, it's yeah. someone who kind of returns to their faith. Um, and yeah, I, I could not let go of this feeling that I needed, I needed to be part of the, the Jewish world and community that I needed to refine my faith, I needed to refine my authentic identity. Uh -huh. um, and even though I wasn't sure if it would completely lead to the rabbinate, uh, uh, you know, it eventually did, I went into rabbinical school, but um, those those years in Israel and in rabbinical school, um, to this day are some of the happiest Jewish memories of my life. So. I cannot imagine. So are you technically still a rabbi? Like, how does that oh, work? I never graduated because okay. uh, I had two years left to go. I had spent about five, five years, six years in rabbinical school when the chronic illness I had since I was 18 worsened mm -hmm. tremendously. I mean, the truth was, I, if you know about chronic illness or my specific illness, um, even though I had been diagnosed at 18, 19, I sort of faked normal. I faked normal through working. I faked normal uh, through through college, through through my career, through relationships, uh, through rabbinical school, until I eventually couldn't fake normal anymore. Mm -hmm. And I actually went into the worst sort of relapse of my disease of my life. And I actually wound up dropping out of school and spent the next two years of my life basically bed bound. So if you want to know what it's like to go from an Emmy award winning rabbinical student to a woman confined to uh, her bed for two years, or as I like to joke, if you think lockdown was bad, imagine that for two years. Um, but really, like, it, I remember the highlight of those years were really I couldn't write. Um, I, my husband had to help me shower, mm -hmm. bathe, actually. Um, and the highlight would be that maybe once every month or two, I would be able to go to uh, the grocery store for like half an hour. Right. So, um, and then again, another change in my life. Do you want me to keep going with this? Yes, keep going. I'm <laughs> so much, as much as I thought I knew, I clearly did it. <laughs> so um, this, I mean, and it's all true, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so as much, so I'm in this process two years, my life fully devolved. You know, I'm my husband's disabled wife at this point. This is my identity. I don't have a career. I don't have a children. Friends have all disappeared, whatever. Um, and I have to make a really, you know, as I say, chronic illness brings you to your very lowest places. And I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice if I was going to survive. And so in that moment, I decided that even if the rest of my life was boiled down to four square walls in this in this apartment in Northern Virginia, even if I was going to be nothing more than my husband's disabled wife, that I was going to find a way to hold on to my joy. And so that's what I did. I cut off, you know, I turned off social media. 
um, I started uh, I started doing things that would just make me happy. So I got a plant, right? I began meditating. I really began to just focus on my health. And also, as I started to get like a little bit better and these increments better, I started to look more outward. Um, I turned those, you know, um, so I collected backpacks from my bedroom for foster children and home, teens and homeless shelters. I um, helped uh, sponsor the creation of a sea door for an online shul long before the pandemic, because I knew that was valuable access points were valuable for people like me. And uh, actually, having watched a reality television show on extreme couponing, I became an extreme <laughs> couponer myself. And I turned those once a month trips to the grocery store into uh, uh, stockpile runs for the homeless shelters and, and food banks in my area. And through this process, I began reading romance novels. So now we're back to the romance. We're back to romance. romance. The most inspiring, <laughs> wild background I've actually ever, ever, I've done like 70 of these episodes. <laughs> I Normally I go in blind and I don't know much, but with you, I, I thought I knew a little bit and I'm just shocked. I'm shocked to my core right now at how, <laughs> first of all, like the tremendous strength you've clearly exhibited in your life and your resilience and your like willpower to go on, but also your selflessness. And like, even in your hardest moments and your lowest moments, trying to like make the world a better place. And obviously that comes from like Jewish values that I'm sure have been instilled in you since birth, but also then like go in rabbinical school and really, really hard, like harnessing those lessons. Like I'm just, I'm in awe of you right now. So yes, please continue and tell me about this romance book tie-in, but I, I'm shocked. Yeah. And just to add to that, I think, I think we don't know our strength until we get there. Right. And I think the truth is the way we survive suffering is by making meaning. It's by having hope. It's by finding our purpose. One of the most difficult parts of chronic illness is feeling that you're not only an invalid, but that you are invalid. And so these little things I could do for other people, I'm going to cry. And these little things I could do for others, it made, it gave me worth right? It showed that my life still had meaning, whether it was to my husband, whether it was a backpack to a child, whether mm -hmm. whether it was something. And also, I was still that girl who had made the decision to live for my values mm -hmm. and not my goals, right? At the end of the day, I have to stand before Hashem, before God. Mm -hmm. Was I Jean Meltzer? You know, not <laughs> was I Zizia, was I Moses? Was I Jean Meltzer? Yeah. So I did the best with what I had been given, but it gave it gave me meaning, it gave me worth, it gave me purpose. Wow. And so actually the decision to sit down and write the matzah ball really stemmed from the same things too, which was that I had an experience with my seven-year-old niece. She looked up at me one day and she said, Aunt Jeannie, you have a big nose. And big noses are ugly. And I was like so upset because she's this, she's surrounded by strong Jewish women. We've never, ever be bemoaned the sizes of our nose ever, ever in my life. Have I ever heard me and my sisters do this? She went to Jewish day school. Uh, somehow she internalized though this message that there was something wrong with the way I, and though I did not want to break it to her, she would eventually look, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's simple. And so I said to like, I, I had this sort of aha moment again, right? Yeah. Where how different would my life had been had I had models of beautiful Jewish women, strong Jewish women stories outside of the Holocaust growing up? And how different would my life have been had I any models of women with chronic illness growing up? Because I did not have one. And so I made that decision to hide it, to fake normal, to fake normal, to fake normal until I couldn't fake normal anymore. And when I wrote the maps of all, I never in a million years thought it would get published or it would change the trajectory of my life. Once again, I literally thought this was a book that I was going to either sell publish or give to my niece. I never thought anybody in publishing would pick it up. But then being a faithful person, I found myself in this new role, right? I am now author, the big A, yeah. and I'm writing yeah. these types of stories. And so it's funny, you know, it's funny how God works. You know, the old saying, man plans, God laughs. Exactly. If I look back on my life, it feels like the plan was bigger than, than my own, what I had originally intended. And so even though I have definitely had my hard moments, I think the beauty or inspiring part of the story is that all that good I put into the world, right? It, it came back in ways I couldn't even imagine. 
A hundred percent. So what was that like having the story of the matzo ball and having the book written and then trying to get it published? I know you said you thought maybe you would self-publish it. You would just print one copy and give it to your niece. Like what was that whole experience like and kind of how did it all happen? So I had before the matzo ball about 10 years earlier had another book and that book went pretty far. I got an r and I had an agent, all that stuff. It didn't go anywhere. And so at some point I decided that for me, pu- traditional publishing was not healthy. Part of like, I didn't like the roller coaster of it. I didn't like the ups and downs. I was going to write stories for me, but I wasn't really that interested in being on the roller coaster. Okay. So I write the matzo ball and I'm like, you know, this is kind of a good book. Like it's structured well, right? It's a, it's three, the three, I like at 40 years old, it finally clicked in my brain. I knew how to properly write a three X structure. And I was like, they might, probably won't want it because it's super dewy and they probably won't want it because of the intersectionality of identity with chronic illness. But let me just, you know, I'm on publishers marketplace and I see an agent had just sold a Christmas uh, rom-com at auction. And I'm like, if you're in writing, you know this. You're like, let me just email a courier. I'm never going to hear back from this person. Right. And right away, she was like, send it to me. Or send me the first three, three, three paragraphs wow. or three, three, three chapters. chapters. Right. And I was like, all right. And the thing was, I hadn't written the epilogue yet. So okay. I send it to her and I'm like, I'll never hear back from this person. It'll be six months from now and it'll be a rejection. I'm not worried about it. About 20 minutes later, I hear, send me the whole book, another email. So I'm like to my husband, hold my beer, even though I don't drink beer. I don't like it. <laughs> hold my beer. I'm going to finish this epilogue. So I don't even think they know this story. So I send it to them and or I send it to her. And then two days later, she, she writes me and she says, my agent and my co-agent, I brought in a co-agent, would like to have a meeting with you. And that was it. They offered. I was like, all right, let's do this. And it, it sold a few weeks later. And that, that was it. That was, I mean, and to think also the book that went nowhere, that was like, a, like it would have been the wrong book at the wrong time. That's the only thing I have to say. I was not ready. I was not physically ready. I was not healthy enough. Um, and I was not strong enough inter- internally, if that makes sense. I had to sort of go through those two years. I had to sort of go through crawling out of my illness hole. I had to rediscover my worth and my value outside of um, what we produce, what we, I had to know who I was. And when I knew who I was, that's when sort of the magic happened, which it, 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 I know, I know when I say it out loud, it sounds, it sounds unbelievable, but this is really how it happened. So incredible. <laughs> and that book completely took off. I mean, yeah. it came out right as right around the time I started my book page. And I kind of started my Instagram account really just to connect with like-minded readers, people that were reading the same type of romance books that I was reading. And upon starting my reading journey, I kind of almost immediately realized how few Jewish books yeah. fiction books, hopeful, happy Jewish books existed, right? Because when you would look up Jewish fiction story, 99.999% of them are Holocaust fictional. Absolutely. Books. Absolutely. And I was like, but where are all the books celebrating like Jewish love and Jewish joy and just like plain old regular fiction stories that happen to have Jewish characters in them? Yeah. And it was around that time that Matzo Ball was going to be released. Like I started my page around November and we were approaching Hanukkah and I started seeing all of this chatter about Matzo Ball and I was like, got to read this. And that's kind of my first like parlay, obviously into your books and into your story world. But then this book took on like a whole new meaning. I feel like now whenever anyone talks about Jewish romance books, your books are at the top of the list. Obviously, Matzo Ball has been optioned now to be made into a movie, which is crazy considering your entertainment background kind of having this marriage now of like your past life and your current life. What was that call like kind of getting that we want to see if we can make this into a movie? Like, what was that conversation like? And especially having so many in like very cool and very niche people involved, like Ben Savage is my favorite human. Like Boy's World is my number one favorite show of all time. I quote it. I watch it every single night before I go to bed. Like he is my lifeline. I was obviously a massive NSYNC fan growing up. So Lance Bass, like you have such a cool producing team behind this. So like, tell me about that whole experience. Yeah. 
beyond surreal. I mean, the truth is you have to remember that for 10, the last decade, I've basically been homebound. The most exciting part of my life was going to the dog park and like sitting on a bench and listening to the dog walkers gossip. Like that was the highlight of like my week, right? This is the most exciting thing I did. And I was very happy with my quiet little life. So to be literally on a Zoom call with Lance Bass, right? And Ben Savage Mm -hmm. is wild. It's wild. You're kind of like on one hand, because thank God, again, I know who I am and I'm, I'm pretty calm about these things. And I really actually... I shouldn't even say it. When they were like, Lance, oh, Lance Bass wants to talk to you. I mean, I don't know celebrities at all. And I was like, oh, from Backstreet Boys? And they were like, no, Gene. <laughs> Wrong man. Wrong boy band. <laughs> Wrong man. Don't say that aloud, ever. <laughs> so here I am saying it. Yeah. But it, it also shows my personality, right? Like, yeah. I, I just, I'm not... I don't get like uh, starry eyed about that stuff. Yeah. I see people very much as like people, unless it's a real housewife, then I will probably scream and chase her down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be fabulous. Um, but, I love that. But um, I like, I just, I've never been like one of those people who gets really like into that stuff. So, so it was it, um, some ways it was just more surreal that like all these things that you you as a as a girl in screenwriting school, I once thought about, I once dreamed about that it was actually kind of happening, or the things you hear happen to other authors happening to you. I think that is the weirdest thing. Like you're like, oh, and then you know, you sort of and you know, but aside from that, my life is still, as I always say to people, my life is still pretty normal. I have to get up, I walk the dog, I yeah. you know, it's you know. Got to pay my bills, got to make sure I'm healthy. So, I mean, right. but it was, it's beyond cool. I'm grateful, especially from where I came. I am beyond grateful for this journey for every single second of it. It's just been so much fun. I, I wish I could just, I don't think authors talk about how much fun it is. No, but it's, it's very fun. There's a lot of fun. Your outlook on all of this is like so positive and just like, you're so like shiny and happy. And like, I'm, I'm loving this conversation. You're just like, I'm smiling from ear to ear for those people who are listening. I'm like literally grinning the entire time you're speaking, but what's the movie coming out? Like, do you know how involved you're going to be? Do you know anything? Are you even able to like talk about it too much? Like where are we Nothing's happening right now because we have this wonderful strike going on. So I imagine when the strike is over, we'll, there will be some sort of like re- retalk or figuring out where things stand. Um, but right now, unfortunately, everything's kind of on hold. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll just see what happens. Okay. Excited. Take so, it with a grain of salt onto the, you know, and you just, yeah. Moving on. So after the Matzo Ball came out, and then you obviously had Mr. Perfect on paper with the success of the matzo ball, like what were you feeling putting out that second book? Like, were you anxious? Did you feel like you had something really big and unattainable to like live up to? Were you just excited? Like I've heard so many mixed stories from authors who have had really phenomenal um, launches with their first book, kind of like fearing almost their sophomore book because of that like expectation. So I'm wondering what your experience was because obviously the matzo ball had just like really taken over and what you kind of felt like putting that book out. So I think for me, it's really funny because again, I have not changed all that much in a certain way. I just wanted to write a better book. Um, I just wanted it to be stronger. I wanted to improve. You know, I've always loved the written word and what kind of writer would I be if I didn't try to you know, I guess the word, is it best yourself? Is that the saying? If I didn't best myself, eat with each uh, subsequent book. So, you know, I try, I think because I've been through so much in my life, I sort of take everything with a grain of salt. I am well aware that all the fun of this, I love every second, that it won't last forever, right? That, you know, Um, It will happen for all of us, no matter what we love and do. Um, And so you take each moment as it comes. For me, if I have done my best at every stage, and that means the best on a day when I'm dealing with brain fog, the best on a day when I can't get out of bed, the best, because that's all I can give a book, right? That's all I can give anything I'm doing, whether it's social media or podcast or whatever. As long as I, I give it my best, then when I let it go, knowing that at every stage I've, I've tried my hardest, there's nothing more I can do. There's right. nothing more. Right. 
So, and I pray a lot. So I pray and meditate. <laughs> I love it. It keeps me centered. <laughs> So now, obviously, with Kissing Kosher, by the time this episode is live, the book will be available for everyone to enjoy, which is so exciting. Before we talk a little bit about this book and the themes of this book, can you just provide those listening who have not yet read it a little synopsis about what they can expect? Sure. So Kissing Kosher is about a man named Ethan Lipman, heir to a baked goods empire, a kosher baked goods empire. And he goes undercover at this artisanal bakery in Brooklyn in order to steal their world famous recipe for pumpkin spice babka. And <laughs> while there, he meets Avital Cohen, who uh, is a woman suffering from sexual dysfunction due to chronic pelvic pain, leaving both to wonder if they have the right recipe for falling in love. I love that. Um, and it's a story that was <laughs> inspired by my, yeah, it was a story that was like partly inspired or very much inspired by my own journey. Most people do not know this, but about the same time I found out the matzo ball was going to be published, I woke up with what I thought was a urinary tract infection, a UTI. And basically eight rounds of antibiotics later um, and three different specialists. And I was like, you know what? This isn't a UTI. And I kind of like, here's the weird thing about being sick for so long with so many different conditions. Like I knew there was a part of me that knew because I remember talking to my mother about it. I was worried. I was like, this doesn't quite feel like a UTI, like something is different. And so basically, all of a sudden, while doing revisions on the matzo ball, I am once again maneuvering the medical system. Um, I am getting surgeries. I am being put in menopause. I am unable to wear. Um, and basically it was, it was horrible. Thank God it's more under control. Now I was eventually diagnosed with interstitial cystitis, which is a chronic, uh, pelvic pain, chronic bladder condition, along with a few other things. Um, and, uh, even though <laughs> chronic pain is not something I recommend zero of five stars, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, the same thing sort of happened with me that happened with uh, my first disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, which is when I decided to come out in 2006 out of the chronic illness closet and do advocacy work, um, I would have this experience with women where they would lean in and say, me too, and whisper it, right? Me too, I'm sick too. And so when I became a chronic pelvic pain patient and I started talking about having this pelvic pain, having sexual dysfunction, not being able to wear pants. I mean, literally, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do my author photos because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to wear clothing, right, <laughs> under a certain... So yeah. Um, yeah. I, like, I had an experience where other women would be like, gosh, I'm going through this too. I'm having this. And I was like, I need to make my third book about this topic because it's it's such an issue where women... Women are not talking about it and it affects men too and, and affects couples. And I really, and even though I hadn't fully processed for myself at the time, what being a chronic pain patient for the rest of my life was going to mean, mm -hmm. um, writing this book changed me and helped me process it. Incredible. And I love the way that this book, because obviously it's a romance book, but I love the way that it talks about intimacy. And I love the way that you kind of structured the story and this love arc and kind of how you talked about intimacy in this book. Can you tell me a little bit about that decision and kind of why you wanted to, I guess, say what you wanted to say in the way you did? Yeah, I think I, for a long time, since Matzah Ball published, I've been thinking about what is Jewish love, right? What is the a Jewish worldview on love? And is that different than a non-Jewish worldview on love? And I think what I can say is that at least I can tell you that the laws around Jewish sex, right? I can tell you that women's pleasure is absolutely protected. Men do not have a right to sex. Women have the right to sex. So not only is Judaism this beautiful sex positive religion, but it also says that the highest sort of sex you can have the, the, is a committed, loving, intimate relationship. But the point of sex is, is to increase love. And it's also not the most important part of a relationship in Judaism. It's one part, but I'm pretty sure any rabbi would tell you if you meet a nice girl and everything else is working right and the sex is a little off, you should still continue to be with that girl. <laughs> I, I guarantee you, because they would say 
Sex changes. Chemistry changes over time. This is the Jewish worldview on love. It is not the most important thing. What is the most important thing is intimacy. And so because in romance, there's so much emphasis on kind of sex sometimes and, and having sex, and there's nothing wrong with those. I love those books. Yeah. But I really wanted to myself explore this idea of the difference between the two. And is there a difference? And what does intimacy look like when you can't have sex? But also, how does intimacy, when you can have sex, be increased or not by sort of this decision to make love with somebody? Right. But I mean, I think I think uh, Judaism has a lot of wisdom. I always say this, whether you're Jewish or not, Judaism has a lot of wisdom to share that has been developed over 6,000 years from yeah. our beautiful Torah. Um, and one of the best compliments I feel like I've received on this book is more than once at this point, someone has told me they've given the book to their husband. And I feel like that is the coolest thing because I really wanted to provide tools for women and couples, uh, tools that are based around sex therapy, believe it or not, um, to allow couples to reach new levels of intimacy themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was important to me because no, I experienced it too. <laughs> no, it's really incredible. And obviously a huge chunk of your audience are like me and they are Jewish and they are hungry for Jewish stories. But for those who are not Jewish, who are picking up your books, what are you hoping they maybe learn or take away from your writing, from your stories that maybe open their worldview to something that they haven't learned before or a common denominator that maybe isn't something that's specific to Judaism, but still applies to them? Like, what are you kind of hoping for, for other people to take away from this book? You know, it's interesting because I actually do have quite a number of non-Jewish fans and readers, mm -hmm. and I think they take away the same thing that the Jewish readers, that these are beautiful stories about a beautiful, you know, the the Judaism in one way, it's a it's it shapes the worldview of the characters, but they're still completely relatable characters, right? They're still living their lives uh, and, you know, working in bakeries and trying to manage chronic illness and trying to manage toxic family members and, you know. You know, trying, I, I think why people are appeal to my books is that my books are a lot like me. There's a belief that like every day we should wake up and we should try to better not only ourselves, but the world around us. And I think, you know, when, when I always also try to write to the goodness of the world, I always try to make sure the book, the books are positive that, you know, there's so much negativity out there. I want to, I want to keep people in a good place. And I feel like, um, that people walk away from my books feeling better too. Mm -hmm. So I think I think whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, that that's the goal, right? Maybe you get to learn something, you know, there's no, you can be educated and entertained at the same time, but mainly my books, you walk away from it and you feel better. I love that. I feel like there's no better way to end this conversation than on that note. So thank you so much for the time. Thank you for writing these books. Thank you for making, you know, incredible statements with your work and doing so much good for the world. And this was such a surprising conversation. These are my favorite episodes to do when I have no clue what I'm getting into. So this was absolutely such a treat and I'm wishing you so much muzzle with this book and this release and like, congratulations. It's, it's incredible. And I'm loving watching your star rise. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for listening. It's really my honor and my pleasure. Love you all. <laughs>